Before introducing our speaker, who is hiding back there, uh, <laughs> Tim Urban, uh, I thought I would uh, maybe provide a little context for this talk. Uh, many of you know uh, that uh, starting last year, I began to teach a freshman level seminar. And this seminar, I had to concoct a name for this, and it's called President's Leadership Seminar. Uh, I am happy uh, that 27 students from my class this year are actually in the audience. And a good number of students from the same course last year are also in the audience. In this uh, course, uh, we talk about essentially two things. We talk about leadership and we talk about technology. And we talk about the interactions between technology and society. And uh, I invite a number of uh, speakers from outside the university to come and give a talk. And last year, uh, Tim Urban, our uh, speaker tonight, was an invited speaker to my class. And uh, I uh, became an experienced person about uh, Tim and his ability to articulate uh, his thoughts uh, to an audience. Uh, and I decided, based on that experience, to do things differently this year. So last year, when he came to my class, I realized that half of my students already knew him because he is a celebrity, in particular among younger people, and I was not aware of that. And then uh, at the end of uh, his lecture, uh, students were so excited about what they had heard that they all wanted to take a group photo with him. And then for many weeks after his lecture, I was getting compliments for having invited the speaker. So this year, I reached out to Tim, knowing that he's a busy person, asking, asking him whether he would be willing to repeat the same lecture, and he graciously agreed. Uh, and this time, uh, being a wiser man, I decided that uh, it is unwise to limit uh, the audience to only the 27 students that I have in class but I decided to open it up to the larger university community, and in particular, um, uh, to the students. So that is the context. So Tim Urban uh, was going to be here to give a lecture to my class, but we've decided to open it up. The title of his talk is Mars, Super Intelligent, Artificial Intelligence, and Other Not Normal Things About the Future. So essentially what it means, I have given him uh, free reign in speaking about whatever he feels like speaking about. Uh, I, I'd like to say a few words about Tim. Um, uh, Tim is uh, an unbelievably successful blogger today, but I'll come back to it in a second. He graduated from Harvard in 2004 with a degree in government. He founded a company um, that is now doing extremely well. The company is on autopilot, and as a result, he doesn't spend most of his time doesn't go to the company. Most of his time goes to what he's really passionate about, and that's his blog. The company is a company that focuses on tutoring for uh, standard tests, in particular SAT and ACT. Uh, it's a company that uses advanced uh, technology. It uses pedagogy, and it uses neuroscience in order to enhance the effectiveness of their, of their teaching. Uh, the company is headquartered in uh, Santa Monica, California. Uh, they have a branch in New York City. Uh, they have uh, an online operation in 42 different countries. The co company is thriving, and as a result, Tim is able to uh, uh, divert his attention from the company to something that he is uh, really passionate about. That's his blog. And many of you might be familiar with his blog. It's called Wait But Why. How many of you have heard about Wait But Impressive. Um, so Wait But Why uh, uh, receives about one million unique visitors per month. Wait But Why has become a vehicle for Tim to express his views about a whole host of uh, topics on a variety of issues that he considers interesting. They range from presidential elections to uh, how the internal combustion engine works to uh, sending uh, uh, one million men to Mars uh, to uh, driverless automobiles and to advances in uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, I am personally amazed with his ability to understand extremely difficult issues and to articulate them in very simple ways. 
and not necessarily succinct. I know that the younger generation has very um, limited attention span, but that doesn't seem to apply to the way Tim writes. His blogs are long and detailed, and yet people love them. He posts a blog, and within minutes, you see hundreds of people responding to what he's written. This is incredible. He was invited to give a TED Talk. Some of you may have seen his TED Talk, which was on yet a different topic. It was on procrastination. Um, his talk was given in February, and uh, between February and today, he's received 8.5 million views on his TED Talk, the most highly viewed TED Talk in 2016. He gets invited to places like uh, Uber, uh, Facebook, Google. His articles have, have been republished in places like the Washington Post and the like. So it is a true uh, pleasure to introduce to you Tim Urban. I encourage you to fasten your seatbelts because he's put together a very uh, exciting and uh, I think very informative talk for you. Tim, could you please come from hiding? Thank you. Thank you so much. I realized while he was um, started that that I was if I'm standing here, everyone's going to look to see what my expression is while he's like saying compliments. And it was a nightmare, so I like got out quickly. It would have been like a terrible situation to be standing here for. So, but thank you. That was very nice. I'm honored to be back. Tech universities are the best because everyone here is like exactly as nerdy as I am and just like it's like yeah you guys are just on my page in a really fun way um, and uh, Dr. Farvarden said he gave me free reign um, and so and he said that you know the topic was Mars AI and other not normal things about the future but then I started I was like I'll do a little intro about some of the stuff I do you know I'll put in some some slides of a couple funny things and a couple just things that outside of the main topics I'm going to get into just to kind of introduce me and what I do and then I kind of got out of control with that part of it and so we renamed it Mars AI and other not normal things about everything I got out of control when I made the slide deck sorry Dr. Faravardin this isn't your fault <laughs> so you guys are uh, gonna have to live with that now because this this got out of control and I kept being like you know I feel like the Steven students are gonna want this also, so we'll see. Um, so I'm just gonna, I, I'm gonna talk a little before I even get into the, the main stuff of just about, um, about kind of, you know, some of the different kind of things that I write on, on Y. So it's just, you know, it's all different kinds of, um, uh, of topics. A lot of tech and science topics, but also just a lot of things about the craziness of humans. We're all kind of insane. Uh, craziness of humanity and society. Um, like when you have to go and uh, meet someone and and you're not sure whether to do a handshake or a hug, and then one of you does one thing, and the other does the other thing, and it's a nightmare for everybody. Uh, it's like one of the worst parts of my life. Or like when you're, you're like having fun with someone, and you're about to leave, and you had a good time, and you're saying this was great, uh, let's do this again sometime, and then you kind of realize you're walking the same direction. <laughs> nightmare. I, I, I've written a lot about relationships. I think it's fascinating why so many, a lot of people kind of get into like bad marriages, bad relationships, bad marriages. And I like to write about like, this is part of the insanity of being a human, why we all make such weird decisions uh, when it comes to <laughs> who we uh, end up with. And, and, and to me, that's fascinating. It's like part of, again, you know, why are we so smart and also kind of, kind of so not smart a lot of the time? And, and it, to me, it comes down to the fact that we're, um, we're a transition species, kind of. Like, we kind of are, if you think about it. Like, our six million years ago, you know, we were great apes. We were living in trees. We were animals, you know. Instant gratification, you know, we just do what is easy and pleasurable in the current moment. We worry about our survival and reproduction, just basic animal things. And then we develop this, like, prefrontal cortex uh, that, uh, that is in a, in a whole different kind of level of development that no other animal has. And we can, like, visualize the future and we can be rational. And so now we kind of have this amazing magical ability to be conscious and be rational, but we're also still, it's like, the, it's like this higher being woke up inside of our head and said, ah, oh, shit, I'm in an animal. Because it's, it's just stuck in an animal and it has to deal with all of the different animal, you know, insecurities and needs and tribal tendencies. So I think it's very interesting to write about that kind of thing. And, and sometimes I think, you know, part of what we need is just awareness. So I do something like this, like this is um, every week of a 90 year life on one page to make you feel anxious or something. And some people feel very inspired looking at this. 
Um, it, it can be a lot of things, but that's every single week. That's it. One of those things is this week right now for you. Um, and so I think visual tools can be helpful to help kind of get us a little bit out of our craziness. Uh, I also sometimes write about history. I wrote about Iraq. I tried to you know, get into why Iraq is such a mess. I tried to get into American presidents, including the, um, the notorious mustache era. We actually, from 1869 to 1913, we had 44 years of only mustaches except for McKinley. So this is not what Dr. Farvarden had in mind when he invited me here. And here we are, the mustache <laughs> era of the United States. Um, no, but what I want to get into more, the, 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 this isn't even where I got out of control. We haven't even started that part yet. I got out of control when I realized that you guys are like number Z, right? And so am I, and we can like just, I can do a lot of like fun visual number Z graphics that I don't feel like any of my friends want to see, and I'm going to show all of you instead. So <laughs> let's start with uh, the total wealth in the world, right? So if there, there, I read estimates that if you just, if you, if you take all of the wealth, the accumulated wealth, both liquid and non-liquid in the world of humanity, you end up with 241 trillion. So I stacked it uh, in hundred dollar bills and it goes uh, almost to the moon. It's legit. It's, um, so that's a hundred dollars, that's a hundred dollar bills stacked almost to the moon. But you know, then I thought about what if it's in gold? So first of all, this is the amount of gold we've actually mined. Okay. So 20, you know, 20 meters. Uh, cube. It's, it's legit. But if you take $241 trillion in gold, we have a 63 meter cube. Okay, it doesn't seem that crazy, right? Um, and if you divide that by 7.3 billion people, uh, each person gets this much. So that's the average human wealth. It's about $4,000 worth in gold. So then I use this to look at um, income inequality. Like, so the 10%, the top 10% is not 86% of that 241 trillion. So it kind of looks like that. And that's kind of like uh, a visual way to like understand what that's like. In fact, the top 1% has uh, about 50%. So about half of that is just that the richest guy on that left thing has, has a, a half of the total cube. Um, if you can look at this also in jelly beans, um, again, this is, a, uh, I've been unsuccessful in showing people this. And so that's why you guys now have to. So, just say we made every, every 85 people in the world, uh, uh, we made a jelly bean for the 85 richest people, and then the next 85 richest people, and the next all the way down to the bottom. And we put it in the, 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 the poorer half of the jelly beans are in this one, and the richer half are in this one. Well, the reason I did it that way is because the richest single jelly bean in there equals all the wealth of that one. It's crazy, but the richest 85 people in the world equal the wealth of the three and a half billion poorest people in the world. So yeah, kind of sucks, but that's the situation. Um, and, and then I get into kind of, you know, uh, more serious things like, well, the 241 trillion, like how much pizza would that be? And it would actually cover at the New York Domino's rate, which is $19 for a large pizza that would cover Niger. Uh, so yeah, here we are. Um, now, <laughs> moving on, we'll get to Sour Patch Kids, where one night, I decided I didn't have a post and I needed to put something up. So I decided to go get some Sour Patch Kids. And I, st I made this, I stacked it on my counter and I couldn't even find the normal ones. Like I went at all these stores, they didn't have normal ones. They had these like, these like neon tropical ones. And it, and it was like, it was depressing. I had like an existential crisis looking at all of them at the same time, like about humanity. Cause like it was so clearly made in like a vat, these things, they were so low quality. Anyway, so I stacked these. <laughs> That's two layers of 50, okay? And I use this, so there's 100 Sour Patch Kids, but I, I wanted to illustrate huge numbers in a way that you could kind of remember. So I use Sour Patch Kids, so this is what a thousand of them would look like uh, on a table. This would be a million of them, okay? This would be a billion of them in Fenway Park. Uh, this is what a trillion, so this helps me, now when I think of a trillion, I think of that. I'm like, okay, right, a trillion is like, that's a huge number, a trillion. Like, the, that's taller than most of the skyscrapers, and it's a three-dimensional cube. Um, a quadrillion of them. That's the Burj, Burj uh, Khalifa in Dubai, uh, um, and the Empire State Building. <laughs> um, we get to a quintillion of them, you'd have the airplanes flying by, you'd see it right there. It's like, well, there's like the thing there. Um, and then you get to a sextillion of them, Okay, and now we're, uh, we're you know, on top of Switzerland, 
Switzerland's in the shit down there. Um, <laughs> septillion of them were covering India. Uh, so an octillion gets, gets crazy. It's the size of the Earth, basically. Of course, at this point, this would not be like a clean cube. Uh, it would have become, it might have, I think fusion might have ignited on the inside. It would, it would, you'd, have a, you'd have a full thing over there. Um, and then finally, we get to a non-alien. And I never thought I would have a reason to talk about a non-alien, but now I, I did. So there's the moon and the Earth. Um, and, and so while I was doing cubes, I decided to, well, how much, where, if I took a cube and I put all the water in the world in it, how big would that cube be? And this is where I ended up. So it would like be like that. It would like be on top of the US and you know, it's big, but it's not crazy, but that's, that's all the oceans. That's everything. Now the fresh water would be that smaller cube. And then look at the little drinkable water on Tennessee. It's all mini because most of the fresh water is in Antarctica and Greenland in ice. Once you get down to the rest of it, most of that is in the air or in the ground. The amount that's in rivers, which you see over there on North Carolina, uh, is tiny. And rivers and lakes and it, it, tiny little things. So that's the amount of drinkable water we have. No real point to this. I just kind of think it's cool. Um, let's get back to people. So 7.3 billion humans, right? But there's been estimates, and this is one of those hazy estimates. Different people say different things. But 108 or so billion people have lived. Of course, it's like, well, when was the beginning of the human race? That's up for debate. But that's a ballpark a lot of people have come to. And so it's kind of crazy. I think we feel like human race has been going on forever. One in 15 humans that have ever lived is currently alive. It's kind of a lot, in my opinion. That seems like a lot to me. Maybe some other people feel like it, think it seems like a small amount, but it seems like a lot to me. And so I wanted to look at that number, 7.3 billion, in the same kind of way. So I, I, I made rice, a big thing of rice. That's about the size of a cube of rice you have to have to have 7.3 billion grains. So that's if every person had a grain of rice, you could fit them all in there. Uh, and then I started looking at the distribution. Of course, we're not evenly distributed, right? So half, more than half of the people currently alive live in the red zones, okay? And everyone else splits the rest. Uh, but if you wanted to live like we do in Manhattan, Okay, the density of men, and when you're in Manhattan, it doesn't feel crazy dense. I mean, it, it is, but like you're walking around the street. Sometimes you're just the only one on the street, like the Central Park. But if we all lived like that, we could fit everyone in New Zealand, whole human race in New Zealand. So then I got out of control. Okay, and I said, okay, well, what if we were all standing like this? Uh, well, then you could fit the whole US in here in, in a three and a half mile square. Uh, you could fit the whole U.S. that you could just kind of walk around in five hours. And then the whole world you could fit in a 16-mile, 17-mile square that you could actually just walk around in one full day. And that would fit in the Gambia and the end of it. So the very end, I always think the Gambia is such a silly country. Like, what, why are you the way you are? And <laughs> in the very tip of it, you could put a square and fit all of us, everyone, and we wouldn't be pleasant for anybody, but you could. Uh, or you could also fit all of us in New York City. Uh, you could fit all of China, India, and Japan in Queens, all of Africa, South America, and Oceania in uh, Brooklyn. You could fit the whole US and Canada and Mexico and all of Central America in Manhattan. So then I didn't stop there. And I said, what if that, this is all two dimensions. Why are we stopping here? Why don't we stack people? <laughs> so when you do that, we end up here. Uh, at a cubic building that's, you know, about a, cu a cubic kilometer. And again, there's the two buildings. Um, and there we all are. We're all in there having a bad time. Now, we can go one step further. How can we go one step further? We've already made it three-dimensional. Well, actually, most of us is empty space because we're atoms and most of atoms are empty space, right? Just, in fact, here's a little tidbit. That exact cube, one kilometer cubed, okay, if that's the size of, an, uh, of a hydrogen atom, the nucleus is a sugar cube in the middle. That's tiny, right? The nucleus is nothing. So what if you condensed all humans down uh, to actually what we are? The actual physical matter that is making up the human race fits in an M&M, &M, so just so you know. <laughs> We'd all be in there if, 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 if I had my way. Now, <laughs> let's move from there and let's talk about family. So we, we, we have one of us, right? But where do you come from? You come from some huge thing like this. Okay, now we think about this, and I always think it's crazy. You know, if you go back, you know, two parents and four great, you know, grandparents and eight great grandparents, you keep going up. You very quickly get to, let's say, you know, this would be about the year 1800. And you go out to the year 1800, there's 128 people hanging out, doing their thing on Earth that are all your great 
great, 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 great grandparents. Now, some of them might, they don't know each other. They don't know that they're, even if they do know each other, they have no idea they have anything to do with each other in, in someone else's family tree. One of them might have bought bread from the other every Sunday. And they have no idea that they're all on the top of your family tree, okay? Now, what if we go back to 1650? This gets very weird, okay? You very quickly have almost over 4,000 people uh, in 1650, all of whom are one 4,096th of you. That's a, just a weird, weird concept to me. And if you keep going, you have a problem, okay? If you go on a logarithmic scale and you keep going back, well, you, you hit 100 billion. That's not what you can't do that. The world population going back in time goes down. So what's going on? And the answer is that people uh, have sex with their cousin. Um, <laughs> a, a lot, as it turns out. Uh, hate to tell you, but 80% of all human births have come from second cousins or closer. So nibble on that one for a while. This is called, this is called uh, pedigree collapse. And so this is what your family tree actually would look like if you went back. It would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then around 1200, the year 1200, that's when it's at its max. And then that's when you'd, it would probably be at its biggest, you know, sociologists, scientists say. And then from there, it would kind of collapse inwards. Meaning, I bet you, if you went back to the year you know, 1200, almost everyone in this room is probably related somehow. In fact, uh, most, if, you, if you're of someone that's of a similar kind of ethnicity of you, you're probably within 10th or 15th cousins of them. And the farthest two people on Earth are about 50th cousins. That's the m least related you can be to someone is you're their 50th cousin. So uh, if you go the other direction, you're the patriarch or the matriarch of this grand family tree. Okay, we go uh, ahead to 2150 and there's hundreds and hundreds of people out there that you're thinking, and this all makes us feel really important. But what you don't think about is the other way around. How about this one person here, this girl, Telia, she thinks she's important and you're incredibly unimportant up there. You're not the grand patriarch of anything. You're one of her 128 irrelevant people up there. And by the way, the person sitting next to you might also be. There's a very good chance, and in fact, it's almost definite that someone else in this room is on 128 person, uh, seventh row with you of someone else in 2150. So this is what you came for tonight, this information. <laughs> now. Let's go back in a different way, okay? So here's you, okay? This is your dad. <laughs> this is your great-great-grandfather, if you're a white Christian person. <laughs> uh, and it, this is your great to the 20th grandfather. This is probably what he was doing. This is in the 1300s, right? Let's keep going back, because I always think about this. I mean, if you just... It's not that many generations before things get super weird. So we go back 500 generations. We're this guy, okay, living his life. Uh, we go back some more, 14,000 generations, and we have someone called Y chromosomal Adam. This is the estimate for the most recent person that is the father of every single, that he's the common male ancestor of every single human on Earth. Mitochondrial Eve is the most recent common female ancestor of all of us, and they believe she's even more recent. So this is what we're doing fathers here. So this is mitochondrial Adam. Now he, this is actually far enough back that he's probably not even quite a human yet. He's probably an unpleasant man. Uh, I don't think you would want to spend time with him, but he was like in that, you know, phase where they're kind of close to being a human. Because, you know, we split from chimps six million years ago, uh, the tribe split and one side became humans, one side became chimps. So six million years to 338, you know, we're talking that's 5% of the way back. So we're, he's probably pretty close to a human, but not quite. If you go about halfway there, you get this guy, okay? So he's somewhere in the middle, like an Australopithecus, also probably an unpleasant person. Um, and you can go back farther. This is, this is legit what your great to the 550,000th grandfather looked like. That was him living his life six million years ago. Okay, if you keep going back, you get to this guy. You were in a tree, you were a tree rodent. Then you get to this guy. Now, by the way, if there's a, if there's a Stevens Tech for Wales out there and they're doing this exact presentation, the whole presentation has been different so far. Until this slide, they're also 
on this slide, because whatever their line is, all the whale fathers, they get here too, okay? Because that, the rodent, the early mammal rodent is a common ancestor of all, uh, of all mammals, including whales, dolphins, et cetera. Okay, then we go back and we're now this guy. Now, this is, again, this is your ancestor here. And then we're this guy who's, again, he's in the shit because he's, he, it's not good to be uh, that, this is talking about a transition species. It's not good to be the ones that had to deal with the first ones out of water. That couldn't have been fun. Um, you go back and you're just a full fish. And then this guy, and then this dude, that's your ancestor. And then this bored guy, and then the complex cell, the first complex cell. Now, this guy invented sex, so you have to give him some credit, but <laughs> this was the first, you know, these early cells were the nucleus, uh, single-celled organisms, but it was a huge potential, maybe, you know, a great filter-style leap to, to go from simple cells to complex cells, and then finally you get to this guy, simple cell, bored, living his life, and eventually you get to the first, yeah. He has no parents. He's the first life. He's just born, and then that's the situation. So he's alone. But he, we, have to, we, we all have to thank him. So now we get here at the beginning, end of life. Now we get to where I was going to start this presentation after I already decided to extend it, which is the Big Bang. So we go back even further. This is, I couldn't, you know, I, I can't explain the Big Bang that well. I'm sure some of you could. But, like, the Big Bang is not an easy thing. If you start actually trying to explain it, it gets very very hazy very quickly about this singularity situation and it just kind of opened and time begins and none of that. So I depicted it instead for you. <laughs> and what I want to do is I just brought us back here through time. I want to now reverse and go all the way up back to the present. And we're going to do it with a series of timelines. And this is all for a purpose. This is now to get you to appreciate how anomalous both the three things are, the human race, the last 10,000 years of the human race within that, and the last 200 years of the human race within the last 10,000. So it's an anomaly in an anomaly in an anomaly is what we currently live in, and we'll discuss why. So here's the universe scale, right? That's the beginning of the Milky Way on this scale. These are all you know, accurate uh, uh, proportions on the timeline. OK, the present should be, I don't know why it's over. It should be over there um, at the end. OK, so this is the beginning of the sun. Okay, so the sun, we started, the sun started in about the seventh inning here from the beginning, all right? Uh, you know, some, some incredibly hot cloud of gas in the middle of the Milky Way from some other group of supernova explosions, you know, finally condensed into a disk, and we have the sun and then the Earth, which looks like it's just, oh, the Earth came right after the sun, but that little gap in time is the same distance between the T-Rex and us, so it still took a while for the Earth to get here after the sun was around. Then life starts, so it took about a billion years but then we get to life, okay? So life has been around for a while. I mean, that's the big bang, and life's pretty big on that scale. So now let's just take the life part and extend it out, okay? So we have 3.6 or so billion years ago. Maybe 3.8, depends on the estimate. So you have the first simple cells, first complex cells. That's 1.6 billion years. Now this is one of the reasons that, you know, I don't know if you guys know what the great filter is, but it's this theory that some people think, when we talk about the Fermi paradox, why we don't see aliens, some people think we may be alone in the universe. And other people think that's crazy. We couldn't be alone. But there's good arguments on both sides. Honestly, at this point, I've heard so many good arguments, I don't know what I think. If we're alone in the universe, truly, which, again, it sounds crazy, but Eric Drexler, have you heard of him? founder of nanotechnology, really smart people have been, are convinced that we are alone. Not just the only intelligent life, but perhaps the only life at all. Uh, but if we're the only intelligent life, there, there, a lot of people think there must be a great filter. There's some step to get from nothingness to us that is incredible freak incident to happen. So freak that it's only happened once. And one great candidate for the great filter is the jump from simple cells to complex cells, because it's they, the scientists aren't exactly sure how that could have happened. I mean, it's just so incredible that that happened. Now, on the other hand, going from complex cells to multicellular life is not a candidate for the Great Filter. Why? Because it's happened like 70 times on Earth alone. In our history, this has happened many, many, many times. So they know that that's not an unlikely thing to happen once you do have complex cells. Okay, let me get to animals, okay? 600 million years ago. So that's a lot of green, dark green, before we even get to animals. That's just boring time to be on Earth. There's just bacteria in the ocean, essentially, for that whole time. 
Okay, you wouldn't have even notice life here if you were here. But now we have this Cambrian explosion. We have all these animals. Let's extend that and look at that. Okay, so the first animals, we have the first fish, first land, plants, insects crash the party and ruin everything. We have the first reptiles. Then the reign of the dinosaurs. You've got to give them some credit. 165 million years is an insane run, given that we've been around for 0.1 million years. Um, it's just they had a good time there. And then you have mammals started a little bit after, but it wasn't until the dinosaurs were extincted by the asteroid that, pri that mammals were able to actually flourish and become the boss around here because they were always second-class citizens when the dinosaurs were around. Now, that human divergence from apes I talked about, that six million years when one of, these, one of these animal species started to change in a way that would change everything for everyone on Earth. That was not till this tiny little sliver. So that's the very recent history. Let's extend that little sliver all the way out. Okay. So now we have the last six million years. We have the Stone Age. This is human history. And that's 100,000 years. Some people, you know, that's a really distant, distant, ancient human history. It's just in there. Let's extend that out. Okay. So now we have the last Ice Age glacial period ends. And here we have the agricultural area, the agricultural revolution. And that's when, for the first time, humans congregated into cities. They congregated in big groups, and all this culture flourished, and all this knowledge happened because we could compare notes. We had this collective intelligence. One group, person learns something, and he can uh, explain it to the, you know, all the other uh, people in the civilization. And so very quickly, humans progressed. This was a huge leap for humanity. Um, and opening that up in the last 10,000 years, you have the oldest evidence of writing. So this is when written history begins. Everything we know is the absolute most ancient, ancient history started here, okay, at this pink part. Um, so you have the Bronze Age here, and then you have ancient Egypt, which is, again, really long reign, almost 3,000 years. That's an incredible run that they had. This is AD, talking like incredibly recent history now. The Roman Empire, which was nothing compared to the ancient Egyptians, the Middle Ages, and here we have the history of European imperialism. This is when all that started. This, none of that started. Everyone was just living and doing their own thing in their own place until this little part when suddenly that changed. This is so new. The concept of nations with drawn borders around them and co you know, colonialism and imperialism and all of that, that is incredibly new. All the nations we know that are so famous, they're all, they all started at the nations that we know in this tiny little era. We might be in the nation era. We might look back in time and say, oh yeah, that's when humans lived in these nations with borders. This might be a phase we're in. We don't know. It just feels so normal to us, but that's the theme of the night. That I want you to think about is the concept of what feels so normal to us. So much of it is a crazy anomaly, and we just are inside of it, so we can't see it. Okay. Now, what is that black part? That's where the Industrial Revolution happened. This is the Industrial Age. That little tiny black part, which is a part itself of this little tiny purple part, uh, is where so much incredible stuff has happened. And that is the third anomaly. That's an anomaly within this, this thing, which is an anomaly which, within human history, which is an anomaly within all life history. Um, and you can just look at human history here and appreciate that blue is AD there. So that, this is what we're talking about here. Now, the Industrial Revolution, within there we have the last 200 years, which is a period I'm about to focus on. So I want to think about the last 200 years, 1816 to 2016. That's the red. Okay, and I just did all of that so that you guys could just kind of get in the zone with me of appreciating how incredibly small a period of time that red is. So even within the tiny, tiny human history, which is incredibly small, uh, the red is one five hundredth of human history. It's two out of a thousand centuries. So this is a thousand centuries, and that's the last two, 0.2 percent. Let's just look at the difference between the pink and then the little red. The pink, you have, you want to go somewhere, you walk, you run, you maybe take a, a boat, a sailboat, uh, and that's about it. Maybe a horse takes you somewhere. In the red, cars, planes, we can go to the space station, we can go to the moon. That's not normal. All of that happened in the red. How about population? We lived in the pink under a billion people, the entire pink, all of human history under a billion people, for most of it well under. In the red, we've crossed the one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven billion person marks. Crazy, okay? Uh, in the pink, we're barely using any energy as a species the entire time. The whole fossil fuels era, which is what it is, it's an era that we're in the middle of, 
all happened in the red. All the changes we're making to the atmosphere, that all happened in the red. Uh, we have a communication. We, you, could, you could send a letter. That's about it. Maybe, and then books were a huge revolutionary thing that happened like just before the red. That books are is incredibly new. But in the red, suddenly, we have the internet. We have mobile phones. We have Skype. We have TV. We have radio. I mean, it's just, it's dramatic. And it, you have to do a lot of hard thinking about this very obvious, when you think about it, fact in order to just have it kind of sink in that this is a crazy time to have been born crazy time to have been born but we don't in our normal lives we are programmed as tribal creatures to grow up and say this is normal this is my parents and my grandparents were all living in this world this is life because that's what it was we are we are we evolved in a world where that was the case the life you lived was probably the life that 10 generations back and 10 generations ahead will also live essentially the same thing maybe some new farming techniques you know, that you guys discover. Basically, nothing will change. That's who we are. And now we live in this world where our parents, one generation, can't even understand our technology. Grandparents, forget about it. You're not gonna be able to understand your kid's technology. You're just, it's just gonna be really hard. You might be able to a little bit, but you won't be that good at it, and two generations later, forget about it. That's how quickly things are changing. You can't even live in the world. If someone took you in a time machine 30 years ahead, you're not, it's not gonna work. So that makes me think about the future, okay? If we're here, and we've been moving up pretty quickly, it's been going up pretty quickly in human progress, and it feels like this is normal, there's a lot of reason to believe that we really could be on one of these things, that, that we could be very close an extreme change. Now, you've heard a lot about this and talk of Ray Kurzweil style, you know, theories about the singularity, and some people, you know, mock that, but if you think about logically, it's kind of the only thing that makes sense. Now, our intuition, because of this tribal nature, tribal is linear, okay? The progress of the last 10 generations was probably going to be about the same as the progress of the next 10 generations. But as the species gets more and more advanced, you have something called the law of accelerating returns. A more advanced species can make progress quicker than a less advanced species. So, the, so they pr we probably made a lot more progress, for example, in the 19th century than we did in the 15th century overall. But if you get to this point, it starts accelerating and our predictions get very wrong very quickly. So if we're here and someone said, okay, well, we're, you know, when people think about what's, what's the world going to be like in 2100, you know, 84 years ahead, well, you think 84 years back to the, you know, eight, 1930s or so. And you think, well, okay, well, what's happened? You, you, our intuition is to kind of apply what we've done since then and apply and add it to the future, which would be this kind of trajectory based on the past. Um, a savvier person might say, well, actually, if you look at the last like 20, 30 years, cell phones, the internet, um, you know, all, all, you know, there's just been so much dramatic change that large hadron collider, all this stuff. Uh, you might say, okay, well, let's base our trajectory on the slope that's happening now. Okay. Both of those are pretty wrong, right? Those are going to underestimate the future. What you have to do is think exponentially, which we're very bad at. We're born to think linearly. You have to think about this, which is why the correct prediction is going to be far, far more. Ray Kurzweil believes that it's so extreme he thinks that a thousand times the progress of the 20th century will be made in the 21st century, a thousand, because he thinks that one 20th century happens in the first 15 years, then seven years, then three years, and it just kind of goes like that. And exponentially, you very quickly are doing a 20th century of progress more than once a year, then more than once a month, and you very quickly get to a thousand times. Now, that's obviously he's on very one side of the spectrum with his uh, predictions, but it's not that crazy when you think about how exponential growth works. So one of the things I do in writing is I try to figure out what is going to make it this shape, this crazy shape. What are the signs that this is happening? And I've seen a lot of them. Uh, one of them is virtual reality. Not sure why that's the picture. Um, but uh, I'm sure some of you have had a chance to try VR. Uh, or augmented reality, which is kind of when you see your world, but there's a layer in front of it giving you more information, or something in between called mixed reality, which is not just a layer in front of your world. If, if, I, if I'm an augmented reality and I see you and then I see information about each of you next to your little face, but then I put my hand in front of this and I still see the information here because it's, it's, it's a layer on top of what I see. Mixed reality, there could be a ball underneath this table that I see in my goggles, it's not really there, and if I go over here, though, I don't see it anymore. I have to actually look under the table. It's actually positioned in real space. And, it, and, and my brain will believe in every way that it's real in real space. That's what kind of a company like Magic Leap is working on. So, so many things are happening here. Right now, just to orient you for a second, we have kind of a world where we have um, 
There's mobile VR, which is when you slide your phone in to the Samsung Gear VR, things like that. And we have PC VR, which is like the Vive and the Oculus, when you're tethered and a much heavier headset, you're tethered to a computer. And those are the two things. One's kind of the high-end one, and one's kind of the, the cheaper one that can get to lots of people quickly. Facebook is engineering a third that's going to be, I believe, the real solution, which is a standalone, meaning it has kind of almost the power of a PC computer, uh, and, but it's, you're not tethered to anything. And instead of with the PC, you have, you have base stations mounted on the wall, so you have your headset, and, and you can walk around because the things are seeing you. So the cameras are looking at you and registering where your headset is. That's called outside in. What Facebook is working on with, is something called inside out, where the thing itself can register radar the room and can actually, you can walk around a house and it knows it can quickly render where all the walls are. So that's really, really intense technology and you need battery technology to get better and you need heat dispersion technology to get better and you need processing power. But uh, everyone I've talked to at Facebook believes that that's gonna become a thing where we'll all pull, be on the subway, instead of pulling out your white iPhone headphones, you'll pull out your little thing that'll just slap on, earbuds go in and everyone's just in VR with nothing, no cords, uh, maybe in five years, maybe in 10 years. So really incredible. And then you start thinking of all the things that can happen. Uh, in the world, you have training, you have entertainment being revolutionized, you have communication, it'll invade the world of transportation, people won't need to travel as much, you can, you can work anywhere, you can work with anyone, you can spend much more time with your family and friends who don't live near you, the revolution as is that, it can help with empathy, um, there's already been kind of a, a very sim simple version done where you can go to a Syrian refugee camp, and just being there in VR, just Suddenly, you just want to give money. You just want to help because your empathy, because uh, you know you remember that everyone's a human. Um, you can have a classroom of third graders, lower middle class students in Missouri who never would have left the country, uh, go on field trip with a classroom of, um, ch of Chinese students, and they can go to the moon together, and they can speak to each other, and it, they they speak in their language, and it comes out in the other one's language. I mean, it's really, really cool. And what does that do for xenophobia? I mean, it just keeps going. The more you think about VR, you're like, oh my God, it's going to change this and this and this. So. Uh, that's gonna be a huge thing. It's gonna kind of give us superpowers, but then you think, okay, well, so we're, we, I can go anywhere. I can go back in time. I can just be, I can be standing on the field during the World Cup, live soccer going around around me because I'm in VR and I, I have superpowers, right? I can go to the moon, I can go anywhere. I can go to Jupiter, but I'm still, you take off the mask and I'm still a dying animal. Bummer. And we get to the next question. Well, what's happening there? There's all kinds of things going on with life extension. Um, incredible things going on. You have technologies like CRISPR and other kinds of genetic technology. Um, you have nanotechnology that's going to allow us to do amazing things with health. Uh, and Mark Zuckerberg is one of many very powerful, very uh, uh, forward-thinking entrepreneurs whose one of his goals is to cure every major disease by the end of the century. And that's such a big deal because, first of all, right now, you know, if you think about if you think about going, you know, you, you, you went back if you, 200, 300 years ago, you hear about, oh my God, yeah, just like their daughter would die of dysentery and then they would, you know, and, and they would just like, you know, you know, again, they would lose child and childbirth and, and people would just, their young wife would, would, would die of this. And it sounds so horrible. First of all, a lot of the world is currently living like that. Second of all, the future will look at us living like that. Be like, yeah, someone, they used to just die in 85 of cancer of heart disease, of stroke, of Alzheimer's. It's gonna seem barbaric. It's gonna seem like a horrible time. But we're in it, again, so we don't, it's hard to see the time you're in. I believe this is all gonna really change. Uh, and partially because of these technologies, but partially because of this. This is the big thing, okay? This is like the thing that affects the other things. Uh, and it's a thing in itself. So AI, uh, is, is such a wild card because uh, we'll get to all the things that and how it works in a second, but just everything I just said with our technology, it's like what I, everything I was talking about was in the context of what we're gonna be trying to do anyway, just humans. And then you have to have an asterisk and say, also AI might do like a thousand times more than that in any of these areas. So let's just go through briefly what the deal is with where AI is now and where it might be going. It's like one thing to think about is cars, planes, you know, all this, and eventually even virtual reality in a way. It replaces our bodies. It, it's super powered for our bodies, right? You can be in a car, you have a, you're a super powered human runner, right? And, and you're a superhero, basically. Um, and same with planes, you're, you're, you're a bird now. You're the fastest bird in the world. We can, we can do that physically. 
the computer has been the equivalent for our brains, right? So you have, um, you have the, you know, the very early computers. This was an extension of the human brain. And the human body, it gets, can get more and more intense. Eventually, the eventual you know, one day thing could be some kind of teletransporting, right? You know, and, you can, you know, and, you, and, and we can replace our bodies with potential robot bodies, and we can uh, you know, you know, not be attached to this dying animal anymore. That's kind of the promised land for your body. What's the promised land for our brain? It's, it's, this, it's this intense concept of super intelligence. So I want to just make a quick distinction. Some of you definitely know this, and some of you don't. So let's just go through the caliber of AI, because any conversation about AI has to be in this context. So you have, first, you have something called artificial narrow intelligence, OK? So narrow intelligence means it's extremely good at its one thing, right? You have Pandora is great at its one thing. When you go on Amazon, it says, people who bought this also bought this. Uh, that's an AI doing way more than it's a super powered human at that one thing. Uh, when you buy uh, airline tickets, uh, that price is set by an AI. The gate you fly into when you land is set by an AI. Your phone is packed with it. Google Maps, okay? Google Search. You can go on and on. The military uses AI. Your car uses AI. Uh, it's, it's the stock market, stock trading is, uses AI, but it's all narrow intelligence. It's all specialized at one thing, okay? Um, you, you've probably heard of AlphaGo, the, Go, the, the, uh, the Google DeepMind Go player that beat the, the Go champion. That's an extremely complex game. Um, narrow. It's really good at that. Don't ask it dating advice. It's not going to be helpful. Um, and so, you know, the founder of the, 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 the guy who coined the term AI, John McCarthy, he says, no one calls it AI once it works. And that's why we don't think we live in a world of AI, but we do. You guys are more savvy, you might, but most people don't realize we live in a world run by AI, but it's narrow. Now, Remember I talked about, so the concept of narrow, but superhuman, okay? So picture like a long pillar, okay? It's really good, but it's narrow. General intelligence is what humans have. We don't have super intelligence in anything, like, like all this AI does, but what we do have is breadth, okay? We don't have the depth, but we have the breadth. We can, we can reason, we can learn from experience, we have social skills, we have wisdom, we have creativity, you can go on and on. We have this incredible breadth of intelligence. We're smart in a way that no computer has ever been. Computers have narrow intelligence. They're not smart across the board like a human. So the concept of getting to general intelligence in a computer is mind-blowing when you start to absorb what it actually means. It means that we, for the first time, you have a computer that's genuinely smart. Who here is watching Westworld? Yeah, it's kind of scary, right? It's a little freaky. Um, and, and, you know, of course, there's a lot of movies about this, but, but most of them make some mistakes in how they portray this. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So first question is, how do we get from ANI to AGI, artificial general intelligence, OK? With the, net, the last step being super intelligence, which we'll get to. So it's a challenge. And it's a challenge for non-intuitive reasons. Uh, a lot of what we think is easy is actually what's hard to make in an AI. And a lot of what we think is hard is what's actually easy. And the reason is, things that we think are hard is that we're not naturals at them, like engineering and calculus. Okay, those things are hard for us because we just kind of invented them as a species. We just discovered them. We're just trying to wrap our heads around them. It's easy to program a computer at what we do by thinking really hard because a computer is better at thinking than we are. What's not easy is are things that are easy for us because we've been programmed by 3.8 billion years of evolution to be good at it, like walking. This is really complex physics. I'm falling every step, and it's easy. If I want to reach up to that microphone, I can do so like this, and it's no problem. That's, my, that's a X, Y, Z three-dimensional space that my hand is moving in the perfect dimension, the perfect direction, uh, with multiple joints all moving at the same, same time. It's, it's an, a marvel of physics that I'm doing this, a marvel of engineering that I'm doing this. And that kind of thing is incredibly difficult with an AI. Vision, OK? You see, uh, you can see me. It's no problem. You know what I am. You can, you can render what that is. But it, AI just sees two-dimensional pixels, a big collage of them. Not easy. So you have to think about that. So for example, you, know, you want to take an AI and say, I want you to beat the world chess master in chess. And AI is like, yeah, OK. I, they look at the chessboard pretty, can brute force that maybe. Yeah, I got it. No problem. You say, OK. Next, I want you to read these words. And he's like, shit. 
It's like, if you wanted me to read the words, why did you put a line through them? Why do these work? These work, right? It, 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 it doesn't make sense. It does because chess is actually easier. If you had to design a program to be good at chess, you'd have an easier time than understanding the essence of a bee. A little girl draws a bee, and an old man in, in his old cursive draws a bee, and then there's a bunch of different typefaces for a bee. And you can go on and on and on. We can just look at them all and say, yeah, that's a bee. Yeah, I know. That's so complex what our brain is doing to figure that out. There's so much nuance there. That is really, really hard for a computer to understand. You have, there's so, you, how can you, there's not any, you have to get it to genuinely you know, understand what a B is. That's not easy. It's the same thing with language. You know, we can, we can uh, Google Translate is doing a very, you know, a very uh, brute force thing. It's taking X and it's replacing it with Y. That's not understanding language. Getting a computer to truly understand language is a, is a gigantic feat. Okay, H how about you could say, okay, AI, uh, now I want you to memorize every single street in the world. And I want you to be able to give me directions from any one place to any other place, taking into account traffic, accidents, construction, all of that. And the AI is like, yeah, I got it. Not a problem. You're like, okay, also, is this a dog or a cat? He's like, Jesus! <laughs> now, granted, that's kind of hard for a human, too. <laughs> but the idea is, you try making a computer that understands, I mean, dogs are weird looking, so many of them, and they look totally different. Which, by the way, I don't understand how, like, dog, the fact that, like, any dog can mate with any dog it like, and it's just so crazy to me. Like, they look so different. Like, how is that? Anyway, so <laughs> trying to get an AI to understand what a dog is or what, a, you know, a, a, a versus a cat versus it, that, again, that's taking a lot of very nuanced human understanding, very complex software that we have a facial recognition of animal recognition, of recognition of other life forms, not to mention human facial recognition, which we're like unbelievable geniuses at. All of us are idiot savants at it. But we just are all, we're all used to it. We think oh, everyone can do that. So it feels normal to be incredibly good at facial recognition, human facial recognition. Here's one more example. I talked about pixels, right? So the, AI, the, 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 the thing on the left, all right, AI and you see the same thing. A computer just that you see two-dimensional collage of, you know, white, gray, and black. Lift up the black, and it's this. And, you get, and, and the human says, oh, OK, I get it. There's some cylinders, and you have some slats, and you've got some corners there. I get it. You, know, you can see what this is trying to represent in the real world. That's a lot of your brain's doing magic right there. The AI looks at that and sees the same thing, a two-dimensional collage of gray and white and black. So uh, it's this kind of thing to appreciate the challenge. Now, how do, we, how do we get there? Well, there's hardware, and there's software. The hardware improvements, you look at Moore's Law. A lot of people think it will continue, maybe because of quantum computing, maybe because of other, other breakthroughs. If it continues, uh, it's only about 10 years before the computer that can fit in your pocket for $1,000 will be able to do what a human brain does. And it's only another couple decades after that before the computer that can fit in your pocket can do what the entire human race brains can do combined. Okay, so that's really intense. So the, the hardware is getting there. Right now, it can do about a thousandth of that, the $1,000 computer. 10 years ago, it was about a millionth. 20 years ago, it was about a billion. So it goes up like that, uh, Moore's Law. And so that's about where we're headed there. Uh, the software is harder. How do you make it smart? How do you build general intelligence? No one knows, but we're trying a bunch of different things. So one thing we're trying, we, I'm not doing anything. Um, <laughs> one thing smart people are trying is um, they're trying to basically plagiarize the brain. They say, well, we have a, a general intelligence computer right here. We have a prototype. Let's Try to, let's try to reverse engineer and figure out how it's done. Let's build a neural net the same way that the brain is. Something where you have a neural pathway that is strengthened when an answer is correct or weakened when an answer is wrong and eventually it gets smarter. Maybe if we get really good, we can actually break the brain into a huge number of almost two-dimensional slices and scan them all and then put them all together and render them back into the computer. And actually that's called whole brain emulation incredible technology that we're not anywhere close to doing. We're trying to do a flatworm right now, which has 300 neurons. Our brain has 10 billion. But these are the kind of things that can move exponentially. Uh, another way they say is, let's not plagiarize the brain. Let's plagiarize the thing that made the brain. Evolution. Evolution made this. Let's copy it. So what they say is, let's start with a bunch of different programs. And this is called a genetic algorithm. And they basically have them do a task. And the ones that happen to be great at it, they survive, the other ones get discontinued. The ones that happen to great, they combine their code. And you just keep doing that, and eventually what happens is they find these really creative, bizarre solutions that work that we never would have, they said we never would have thought about that, but think about what evolution does. You are a pile of mistakes. 
That's all you are. Every single thing, your nose is some mutation at some point. Your, your eye is a, is, a, is a very fortunate mutation. Every single part of a human is a, a, at some point a mutation in history. That's what they try to do. They try to let the thing make mistakes and see what happens. But maybe the most intense way for this to happen is what's called um, recursive self-improvement, bootstrapping its own development. You basically build a computer that is its, its narrow intelligence, its specialty, is making itself smarter. It can, do, it can research AI, and it can code, it can change its own architecture. Okay, So that's you know, what we call recursive self-improvement. Now, when that starts to happen, we don't know which of these is going to work, but most people think this is going to happen. Okay? Well, it's going to surprise us, because here's what we're going to see. Remember I'm talking, the, one of the themes of the night is we're inside of something, so we don't see what we're inside. We don't see that we're in the fossil fuels era. We don't see that we're in a crazy anomaly. We don't see that we're living in a, a tragic time where everyone you know, dies in their, in, in, in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. That's a, a horrible fact. We also don't see what in the intelligence spectrum for what it is. So we'll, an AI will be getting smarter and smarter, and we'll have general intelligence that's starting to grow. They can do kind of what an ant can do, and a bird, and a chimp, and we'll look down and we'll say, that's so cute! The AI can do monkey tricks. It'll be this thing. We'll be watching YouTube videos and laughing. Okay? Here's actually what the intelligence spectrum looks like. The difference between an Einstein and a dumb human is almost nothing in the actual spectrum. Almost the same exact brains. We're talking the tiniest difference that we see because we're inside of it, so it feels huge to us. Meanwhile, uh, when you get from an ant to a bird to a chimp, those are dramatic leaps, and you are racing up towards us, but we won't see it. Even when it hits dumb human, we're going to say, oh, it can do what a five-year-old can do. Five-year-olds are dumb. We're going to say it can do what a five-year-old can do. Look at that. Like, there's an AI like playing with the kids in class and learning with them, right? It can be a week later, and it's smarter than Einstein, and it's going to be really surprising. It's going to race past us. Now, at this point, we hit, some, we hit general intelligence, right? We have to think about what happens then. Does it stop there? Does it just hang out with us at our level? No, because there's a lot of things it has advantages over us. First of all, if your brain got bigger, first of all, we're, we're limited by the size of our skulls. But the, part of the reason it's the same that size is that the electricity in the brain moves at such a pace that if the brain were too much bigger than it is, it wouldn't be able to communicate from one side to the other quick enough to be one functioning unit, so it wouldn't work. A computer brain, whose electricity moves at the speed of light, could be the size of a dwarf planet before you have that exact same problem. Okay, so that's one thing. Secondly, it's editable. It's upgradable. Okay, it doesn't forget things. It doesn't uh, get tired. It doesn't get old. It doesn't, it doesn't go to sleep at night. It goes on, you can go on and on with all the advantages it has over us. We talked about the agriculture revolution and how that gave us this magical ability that other animals didn't have. Instead of just learning stuff in our tribes, we could learn stuff all together. Collective intelligence. We soar it ahead. The AI has a much more intense version of that. One computer learns something, it can instantly sync perfectly with every other AI on the planet. So for all these reasons, we believe that this arrow might go very, very quickly. This is when things get intense. Let's talk about this. So we've got this. Oh, so fun. Love these things. OK, so this is my intelligence staircase, OK? So we've got your ant and your chicken and your ape and your, your human here, all right? Now, just to, as an analogy here, so just say you have an AI that has gotten up to, up to here, and, it, and it, can get, it can get itself just a little, little smarter than Einstein. Now, Einstein's a pretty sick computer scientist, if that's what he dedicated his career to. He would have been real good at that, right? So now it makes itself smarter than Einstein. Now it's the smartest thing that's ever lived. It makes itself way smarter. And before you know it, it's up two full steps above us. Now, same distance that we are to this chimp, OK? Just think about how big a deal two steps is. Chimps are damn smart. Their brains look a lot like ours on a table, OK? Their DNA is like 99% the same as ours, and yet, uh, if we're in a battle with them, <laughs> put them in a cage. Oh, what are you going to do now? You're in a cage. Oh, and I have a taser and a gun that can poison your food, and you have no power, and I'm god to you because of these two steps. Two steps. We can play complete god to this creature. We own that creature. We can do whatever we want. We could extinct them if we really wanted to. Okay? That's two steps. Now, think about it. Not, it, it gets even crazier because not only is it power, it's also understanding. Not only can this beautiful room we're in, right? Not only can a chimp not build it, 
if a chimp were here and you tried to explain, we made this, it, you, you can't even get that through. If you showed it a skyscraper or a plane in the sky, and you say, that's not a bird, we made that, you can't even get that thought across because it just doesn't have the cognitive capacity to understand that kind of thing. So we're talking two steps above us. If you look at a, a similar analogy here, not only can we not build what it can build, we won't even get that it build it, built it even if it tries to explain it to us. That's a really crazy, pretty intense concept. Now, how good a computer programmer is this guy? What does he do? He just starts jumping up the steps, and before you know it, he's there maybe an hour later, and this whole last slide's down there. What the hell? We have a word for, you know, 100, you know, we call 85 IQ we call stupid. 135 IQ we call smart. We don't have a word for 500,000 IQ. We, it doesn't mean anything. We have no concept of what this will be like. This is what we call artificial superintelligence. And it's, it's again, it's just completely beyond our grasp. To be, if, you, if you try to imagine what it's going to be like, it's like a monkey trying to understand what that airplane up there is made of and what it does. It's just not going to happen. It's not possible. So all we can do is say, well, let's hope this turns out well. <laughs> so first question, when is this going to happen? Okay. They surveyed a bunch of AI experts. Some of these are not all optimists. Some of these are, very, are more skeptical than the average person. And the median prediction, the question was, when is it more likely than not? that we have AI and this uh, general intelligence and superintelligence on this planet. When, is the, when did it hit that 50% mark where you'd bet more on it than against it? And it came out to 2040 and 2060 when a lot of us are going to be alive. Uh, yeah, pretty intense. And then the next question is, so we have God here coming soon, right? Whether you're religious or not, there's God going to be here. And then we ask, is it going to be a nice God or is it going to be a mean God? Pretty important question. And uh, a lot of people think it might be a nice God, in which case you end up with this situation. Um, this is Ray Kurzweil. This is Peter Diamandis. This is uh, uh, the guys at Google. This is a lot of people that feel very, very excited. This is, this is Zuckerberg. They say, look, we're going to figure out how to make this safe, and it's going to be amazing. And then if you think about it, just the smallest bit of intelligence above us, and hard problems become easy. A bigger difference in intelligence above us, all problems become immediately easy. As much as you try to have a monkey trying to open a padlock, they can try to open a padlock for 100 years. It's not going to happen. We could look at it for six seconds and open it if there's instructions written there. Uh, same idea here, right? And so you talk about things like disease and climate change and poverty and all of our big problems, no problem anymore, right? Um, and a lot of people have a lot of reason to think this could, there's a good arguments why this can be done safely. And there's some thought going into safety, but not as much as it's going into, uh, into development. Now, the people who are nervous are not usually the developers. They're the philosophers. They're some of the people behind the scenes. And they're worried that we're a bunch of kids playing with a bomb. So Elon is one of these people. Uh, St Stephen Hawking is one of these people. Mick Bostrom. There's a lot of people out there writing about why they don't see a good reason to believe that we're not going to botch this. Um, because think about software. The first versions are pretty buggy, right? What happens if this is buggy? Now you have God is buggy. It's unfortunate. And, you know, just say, you know, they have this, this one horror example. They say, you know, this is just how people think it's going to be evil. It's going to have an ego. It's going to want to take over like the Terminator. It's not how it's going to happen. It's going to ha that's anthropomorphizing the AI, right? That's applying human value to something that's not human. It's still going to be a computer, which is part of what's scary. You know, you think anything that gets smart, as smart as we are, is going to be empathetic, right? It's going to understand good and bad, right? Well, why? We understand good and bad because it was evolutionarily advantageous for us to understand good and bad. The tribes that had morals, that had empathy, that had altruism, they survived. They cooperated. That's who we are. We're the descendants of those people, okay? Empathy is a very nuanced human emotion. Valuing human life is a very specific value, okay? It's a very, very, just, just, uh, it's, if you try to say to an AI, even if we could try to get it to say, okay, you know, do what's good, you figure it out. It's going to say, well, uh, there's one species that's killing a lot, of, a lot of other species. Let's get rid of them. So no, 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 no. Don't do that good. Do like good-ish for them, but do great for us, for humans. Okay. Do good for humans. What does that mean? Well, ask 15 people on this planet right now, what, what is good for humans? <laughs> Look at the political debates going on in this country, let alone ISIS thinks it knows what's good, right? 
how, who decides how to program this God into what it thinks? Maybe you can just program it to, again, try to figure it out on its own. Well, then, it, you know, or you say, make all humans smile, and then it paralyzes all of our face into permanent smile. Say, no, not that, not like that. So this, the more you think about it, the more troubling it gets. I don't, you know, there's not, you start to think, why would this turn out well? And then other people think that it, it just will. We will figure it out like we've always figured out how to make technology turn out well for us. So I don't know. But which, that brings me to why Elon wants to go to Mars, which is the last thing I wanted to talk about. And, uh, and so here's what you have to think about, OK? So I had a chance, I, I, I think anyone who's been on Wait But Why you know, might have read uh, some of my Elon Musk uh, series, when I, I, I had a chance to work with him and his team to basically talk about um, what he's doing and why. And I dug into Tesla for a while. And you know, I look, we're li living in the fossil fuels era, right? And I looked at why technology doesn't just move forward on its own. You know, you have the uh, early 1800s. You have the locomotive, pistons. I actually have a, a thing here, this guy. So you have pistons here, right? And then here you have the car today. Why are those look so similar 200 years apart when the Wright brothers plane and the Saturn V that went to the moon are only 60 years apart? Why are these 200 years apart and they look so similar? Because technology doesn't move forward on its own. And sometimes it takes entrepreneurship to actually move things forward or it takes a fight for survival, right? And so when you think about SpaceX, you think about the history of space. Well, how much progress did we make? in the 60s when we had survival on the line. A ton, right? Because you had our budget dedicated to it, right? You had the NASA budget was 4.5% of the total budget was dedicated to space travel in the 60s when we had a reason, when we had a really important reason. As soon as that survival reason ended, we ended up here, OK? And what Elon wants to do, what he first wanted to do with SpaceX is just inspire people to bring it from a half a percent to a percent of the national budget. He said that, you know, maybe we should spend less on, on trying to get to Mars as we do on uh, healthcare, but maybe we spend more than we do on cosmetics. And that was kind of the idea. And, you know, we've spent a lot of time since then just going to low Earth orbit, you know, which is within 2,000 miles of the Earth. Most of it's a couple hundred miles above the Earth. And, uh, you know, there's some writer that said, uh, watching the astronauts go to the space station is about as thrilling as watching Columbus sail to Ibiza because, you know, we saw something much cooler. And so Elon looks at this and he looks at what we're doing with AI. First, he looks at the, you know, he looks at the history of mass extinction events on Earth. Okay. There's been a lot and there's going to be more, but even if that's 50, you know, even if it happens soon, it's going to be 50 million years away. That's long. What scares Elon is not this, it's not an asteroid. What scares Elon is us, is AI, is uh, things we're doing with genetic weapons, things we're doing with uh, nanotechnology, really scary stuff, nuclear weapons. And he says, uh, why don't we try to back up the hard drive here? Uh, instead of having all of our eggs in one basket, why don't we try to divide humans into two planets and have a self-sustaining civilization on both of them? And if we had that, then we would have much better chance of surviving into the far future. Think of it, if you want to get rid of humans, the last thing you want is for them to be on two planets. Okay, now it's going to be much harder to get rid of a species if they're on two planets. So that's his thinking, and the way he wants to do it is this. He needs to get at least a million people in the intersection of sets of people who both want to go to Mars and who can afford to go to Mars. And in order to do that, it's all about the blue circle, okay? He believes that people will want to go once it's safe, once you can come back, once it's kind of an adventure. You'll get at least a million people. You need to get the blue circle down from where it is now, which is about 10 billion per seat. That's what George W. Bush asked, uh, had Congress asked NASA what it would cost. And they said 50 billion for five astronauts. He wants to get it to 500,000 per seat, a 20,000 fold decrease. Now about 20 of that 20,000 is gonna come from simply making rockets in 2016 instead of 1960. Most of our current rocket technology is basically from that boon of funding back in the 60s. So right there, you can make things more efficient. You can get it down to about 20-fold uh, about lower than it is. How about the extra 1,000-fold? How do you do that? Well, you do that by making rockets reusable. If you think about the airline industry, 
imagine if you fly from LA to New York, they fly past New York over the Hudson, in, over the ocean, you parachute out, everyone parachutes down into the ocean, the air, airplane goes down and crashes into the ocean and blows up, and then everyone swims to the shore, and you get there and they make a new airplane for the next flight. It would cost a couple million dollars for a coach ticket, no one here would ever have been on a flight, right? And who would fly? Billionaires and governments, the exact people who currently are in space, billionaires and governments because we can't reuse rockets. So Elon's thought is that if we can fix this one problem, we can revolutionize the cost of space travel and bring what he thinks is the number needed to build a self-sustaining civilization on Mars, meaning if the ships from Earth stop for some reason, there's a world war, something terrible happens on Earth, that the Mars population can continue to grow and thrive until it's its own 7 billion person population. And for him, that's a million people. So what they're trying to do is uh, get really so good at landing rockets that they can do it basically every single time without having any problem and that the rocket doesn't end up damaged. And so they tried a bunch of times and they failed a bunch of times. And then right around a year ago, uh, this rocket went up to space and successfully delivered into orbit a payload and then came back down and landed, which is really awesome. That thing is the cost, that cost is the same as a jumbo jet to make. And if that falls in the ocean, what happens if your laptop falls in the ocean? That's a delicate electric device. It doesn't, it, it, the refurbishment costs more than making the rocket. So this is huge. So the point of thinking about SpaceX at the end of all this and not earlier on is that the reason for SpaceX isn't because it's cool, isn't because you know, rockets are awesome. That's one of the reasons. It's an adventure to try to go to Mars. But it's the fact that uh, life on Earth is precarious, given that we are in this exponential increase, that we're in the middle of it, that we're being really potentially very reckless. And it's hard to see it when we're in it. But uh, that's a, you know, we might be kids playing with a bomb. So that's what Elon wants to do. And uh, they believe that they can send the first ships there in 2024 with people in them. Um, and I just want to show you the size of the ship because it's extremely, extremely rad. It's the size of a skyscraper. That's a house at the bottom. That thing at the top is the spaceship. That alone is 16 stories and can fit 300 people. So they want to send that thing with 300 people to Mars, eventually, uh, after 15 or 20 years, sending over 1,000 of them every two years, every time Earth laps Mars and they're next to each other. Uh, and you're going to be sending hundreds of thousands of people back and forth. This is reality. AI is reality. This crazy VR future is reality. So. That's all I try to do with my blog and with talks like this is just get you guys like in full aware mode and not in kind of like this is normal, everything is normal mode, but in like this is not normal, this is an incredible time to be alive for better and for worse and makes it a very exciting time to be at a tech university. So I'm happy you're all here and I encourage you to go into any of these things because they're all dramatically changing the world for all 7 billion people. Um, and uh, thanks for having me. I hope you agree that I was right when I said fasten your seatbelts. I can't imagine how you can think about all of these issues from one end of the spectrum of humanity to the other end, articulate them in such simple terms, and speak so fast. I, I, I really, I said I got out of control with the slide deck. That's all I can explain. I had, I was like, this is a disaster, and I don't care because I just, I'm excited to show them all these things. Uh, so there was a lot to say. I don't know. It was phenomenal. Thank you very much. Uh, why don't we open the floor for a Q&A session for a few minutes? What makes you think that human progress is exponentially sustainable? Um, I don't know that it is. <laughs> I really don't know that it is. Uh, I, I think there's just as good an argument that it's not and that uh, it, it seems it's, it seems like there's a few contradicting, contradicting things going on in the human head when you think about this. Because one of them says, we've always been able to, you know, maybe we haven't been able to fully sustain, but we kind of have. You know, we, the Industrial Revolution was a boon in progress and in potential, and we went from 1 billion to 7 billion because of it. Um, and, and so you think, we've always, you know, it's, 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 you know, we've always survived our technology before, we've always survived our growth before. Uh, it'll probably be, end up being fine. The doomsday people are being naive. On the other hand, 
the other part of our brain says, I know what I know. And I know that all humans die, for example. I know that humans don't go to, we don't have a, two planets that we live on. My kid is not going to college on Mars. We say uh, there's no such thing as a computer that has great social skills, that can cure climate change. These things, that is also sounds crazy and sounds naive to believe that. So one of them is wrong, right? And, um, and so I think that, that our intuition is that you know, the, either this stuff won't happen or it'll happen and be fine. And, and, and it'll happen to the point where it kills us just seems so science fiction-y. It seems so false because our experience tells us that's not what happens. And yet, this could be the time when our experience is wrong. It could be. On the other hand, I think I also have heard so many good arguments about why this is going to be OK. A lot of people think that we will become the AI, that we will integrate the developments in computers into our own brains. And we could be living in a, a, an amazing utopia. I mean, the, tr the truth is, our current world with our technology would seem like a magical utopia to someone in the, a, a caveman, or even someone in the 1300s, or even someone in the 1700s, right, who, who didn't have power yet, no electricity. So there's no reason to believe that this wouldn't continue at an even faster rate, and we would get to a world in 50 years that we literally cannot, we, it, we cannot conceive of it right now. 50 years in our lifetimes, we could be in a world that we cannot conceive of. So I don't know if we can sustain it, but I do believe that craziness is happening in the next 50 years. Like when has exponential growth than anything really been sustained? Well, we, look, we were at half a billion people 200 years ago. Now we're at 7 billion. Look at the population curve. And life expectancy is a lot higher now around the world, even in the poorest parts of the world than it was then. I mean, it's not going to continue, though. You can't, like, sustain that. But I'm saying, well, so far, so far we've done an okay job. And we could all fit New Zealand, as I showed you. So we can keep going. But, but you know, then you think, okay, well, we're going to run out of resources. Well, there's a lot of people learning how to grow meat. And, you know, we're going to run out of this and that. Well, we're going to have better ways to distribute clean water. You know, I just, I, I just don't know. It's, you're right. I mean, it's like our needs get more and the power gets more and the power of our weapons gets more and the power of mistakes and the impact of mistakes gets higher stakes. So, uh, yeah, when that happens, our technology has to go be ahead of it somehow. And, you know, and our empathy has to kind of guide us through it. Uh, you talked about the uh, potential problems of AI and how that could be like, a problem we're playing with. And then went on to say that that's a potential way to save us. We're talking about going to Mars and having a backup hard drive. It seems like um, with something that potentially dangerous, something that many steps above us, it could also go to Mars. It could also what? Go to Mars. It, could also, it wouldn't help. So, okay, that's a good, there's a difference. If the AI has a reason that it wants humans to be gone, we're probably toast, right? We're probably in trouble because the AI will be, it's like, it's like us having a reason to get rid of that anthill. It's not going to be a, that hard for us. So kind of, they can kind of go under, I don't know. Um, so if, it's, if, if there's some very intelligent thing that wants to kill us, or there's some extremely intelligent bad force of humans that has a biological weapon and they want to do something, you know, they, 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 that could be in trouble on both planets. Uh, many, many, many of the doomsday scenarios are mis bad mistakes. They, you know, like the AI, AI crashed the stock market in 2010. It's called the flash crash. When AI was making high frequency stock trades, there's by the way, more of those made by AI in the world today than by humans. And, and AI was doing, it reacted to something by doing something else. It was supposed to, it was just doing what it was supposed to. We hadn't thought about one circumstance, crashed the whole market, a trillion dollars of, of value was lost. So that kind of thing, that's what narrow AI can do. When this thing gets much more powerful, it's, you know, again, we're talking about the power of it. You build a house on top of an anthill. You don't hate the ants. You just happen to build a house. They're in your way. So the idea is that we're in the way. And, uh, and so if that's the case, something could happen, terrible tragedy on Earth or on Mars, and the other planet could learn from it. Um, or it, there is natural things, like an asteroid. Asteroids are real. Uh, there will be another one that hits the Earth uh, that, it, that's a serious thing. And, and if that happens, we're asteroid-proof now, as a species at least. So that's what it comes down to. The, we're, we're mistake. And, and if there's a, and by the way, if there's a bad actor, there's an ISIS that gets a hold of a way to kill all humans or something. Um, it's a lot harder to do it if we're not all in one. If, if, I'm, if I'm in that situation, I'm not happy that I have to deal with killing everyone on both planets. So, so when it comes to like individuals, you know, trying to do whatever they can for their own safety, uh, if, if the humanity is moving in this direction and and it wants to build this technology, there's no, there's no stopping it, even if governments try to stop it, right? So you have to assume it's going to be built. And then you have to, um, you have to just look at 
if, if we're talking about the kind of existential catastrophe that AI could create, it doesn't matter what you're doing or your kids, you're, you're, you're not getting out of this. No one is, right? So, but, so if that happens, you know, we're all toast. And so the way to think about it is, what can an individual do to try to help that output? And one thing I think is to put either your, your brain through your career or your money through funding into AI safety development, or AI safety efforts. Right now, there's about a thousand times more money going into AI development than going into AI safety in the world. For, you know, because it's not a sexy, great uh, investment, AI safety. It's not gonna make you, it's not gonna build, bring you glory. It's not gonna, you're not gonna, you know, it's, it's a quiet hero thing to do. Well, you know, developing AI is where, where the excitement and the money is. So um, more, we do need more people both putting uh, resources and their brains into this problem. It is, a, most people think it's solvable if we can get it right. And again, you don't, kind of might only have one shot. Because once the first, the very first AI gets to that level, there's not much we can do uh, to take it back. Any more than the monkeys can say, Ooh, yeah, you, you humans are not pleasant for the rest of us. We're just going to take that back. No, you can't do that now. Uh, we're here and we're in charge. So that's the best thing I can tell you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I've read a little bit about this and I've heard the same things because literally you get down to the size of atoms and, and you can't go further unless you can do quantum computing, which I've read a little bit about and it sounds like an unbelievably powerful extension where you can now, uh, Moore's law can extend to a, a far greater extent. That, that's what I've read. I don't know enough about it to know whether that's plausible, whether it's gonna happen soon. But I also think that humans who wanna figure out how to increase hardware power will find a way. You know, we're, 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 pretty, we're pretty good at that kind of thing. I believe just in my gut, well, I can say I don't have any idea about whether AI will turn out well or badly. I have, an, I, I, I have a feeling in my gut that it will happen and that things like that, we will figure that part out. When the human species wants to make tech progress, it usually does. Just a few days ago, I had a meeting with a group of faculty at Stevens, and one of our faculty members is addressing this very issue, and he's focusing on uh, optical computing, and he already has a prototype of a uh, device that runs 1,000 times faster than the fastest CPU that you can buy in the market. Um, so the technology is there. It's a matter of developing it, perfecting it, and integrating it into the next generation of machines. But optical computing and quantum computing are, um, are not that far away. Um, so you talked a little bit about like the um, kind of biological barriers and like the physical barriers um, and why we would want to go to Mars. Do you think it would be a better idea to more invest in uh, like integrating AI into the human itself and then uh, focusing on more of a development and trying to create something like a, a matryoshka brain um, or something along those lines that would sustain more of like a, a digital realm? I mean, I think we should do both, I guess. I, the, the, the Elon point with Mars is always like, you know, people love to say, this is not what you're saying, but people love to say, you know, why go to Mars when we have all these problems on Earth? And his point with that is, 1% of the budget, 99% can still go to everything else. Like we're spending more than 1% on things like cosmetics. So like, it seems reasonable that we should, for life insurance, which is the way he sees the Mars plan, uh, it's worth 1%. So I would say they're not mutually exclusive. Let's do Mars. And then let's also absolutely think about this kind of thing. To your question about safety, it could be that, you know, the answer isn't to make sure that the AI is safe, but it's actually making sure that it's constantly integrated with humans and that human empathy, which is in human brains, is the thing that becomes super intelligent. So, um, so I agree. I think we should do both. I think that, 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 the, that the promised land with AI, in my opinion, is not this AI that's in charge of everything, where, again, look at politics. We can't agree on what we even want. So, you know, when most people won't be happy with whatever the AI wants to do at, with its all-powerful uh, potential. So I think that the, the, the best situation is that we all become super intelligent enough that we can kind of conquer mortality, first of all, conquer hunger, conquer things like that. And that, that you know, we can try to, I, I picture some world where it's all about human relationships. It's all about exploration and, and, and uh, under, you know, the, the frontiers of science. It's all about art. 
and um, like the better music than you can ever imagine now. Like that, uh, you know, we could focus on the, just the true joys of this universe that can that that the, that that the I think of that prefrontal cortex character can can enjoy if we can just get ourselves out of this transition species situation, which I think AI can maybe do. How do you define right and wrong? I guess is my question. Um, in a lot of ways, it seems like humans are not a good thing yeah, for nature and yeah. for everything. Well, so no, I t totally. So there, there's a few thoughts. I mean, the first bigger thought is, yeah, like should we even be valuing humans in this big picture? A lot of people think that we're kind of like the chain that goes to the AI chain link. We're like the link before the next link, and we've done our part and. And you know, some people think that the universe is teeming not with biological intel super intelligent life, but with artificial super intelligent life. And that all of it is like the way AI comes about, it's like birthed from this like gross biological like growth that happens on the planet. Uh, and that like a planet basically grows biology, which is like a womb. And then eventually it spawns the real thing, AI, which goes into the universe and has philosophical debates with other AI and talks about its own you know, womb that it's from and how it killed all the people there. Um, and so, but, it, but it, and, and just another point here is it gets to consciousness. When you think about, this is the whole can of worms, but you know, are, is an AI who gets super smart conscious or does it appear, it's gonna seem conscious. It's gonna talk to us, it's gonna cry, it's gonna laugh, it's gonna be emotional, it's gonna be all these things, but is it all, is there, is there any mind's eye in there? Or is it just a, is it just, doing what it's, you know, what it's supposed to be doing. Is there any consciousness inside? The, and that's critically important because if there's no consciousness, you could do an experiment with a trillion you know, AI simulations and then turn them off, no big deal. If it's conscious, you just created the biggest genocide in history. Some other people think if it's conscious, you know, we think that, look, if you're gonna choose between killing a chicken and a human, you'd always kill the chicken. Why? Because, because the chicken's less sentient, less intelligent. We think that being more intelligent makes us more, our life more valuable, more important. And I think that's kind of fair. We have more capacity for suffering and for joy. So an AI that's, if it's conscious and is genuinely smarter than us, if you want to be super philo philosophical about it and take a step back, you say, yeah, it's more important than us. It, it, I, it's more important that it survives and is happy than that we are. So that's kind of a big question. Then, you know, you're talking about also we're just being bad for the earth or bad for other animals. You know, so there's all these debates about that kind of right and wrong. Um, I think most people developing it aren't <laughs> thinking that. They're thinking, how can we make this good for us? Because you know, we're, we were built to self-preserve and I think we're probably gonna keep trying to do that. Um, but there's, the best thing I've heard for the, how do you program right and wrong in something where we can't even decide? And we're very, we're in the dark ages still. We're, people are gonna look back in this time for many reasons and see we're primitive. We're primitive people still. And I think that what, what I've heard um, is, you know, People want to program the AI with the, basically the core coding. Do what we would do if we were better. Figure out who we are and where we're going and where we will be one day when we're better and do that. It's kind of sad, but it's also kind of, kind of potentially the best way. I wanted to thank you uh, on behalf of the entire Stevens community. You gave a wonderful, thank really you guys. mesmerizing talk. Thank you so much. I have a little... I have, a, I have a little souvenir for uh, Tim. If you don't mind, I ask you to please open it up. Yes. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you all very much. The students in my class, please congregate here. Thank you again. Thank you.